Λοιπόν, θα συνεχίσουμε με τη διάδειξη, διάδειξη του καθηγητή Παπαλόη. Ε, να πούμε λίγα στοιχεία για το βιογραφικό του. Καταρχήν να πούμε ότι είναι καθηγητής στο Imperial College του Λονδίνου. Συγχρόνως βέβαια είναι consultant και μάχημος χειρουργός στο αντίστοιχο trust του Βρετανικού ΕΣΥ. Γεννήθηκε στην Αθήνα, τελείωσε το Βαρβάκιο και αυτό το λέμε επειδή ήμασταν στο ίδιο σχολείο. Λοιπόν, τελείωσε την Ιατρική Αθήνας, ε, πήρε διδακτορικό στην Ιατρική Αθήνας και μετά έκανε μεταδιδακτορικό δίπλωμα στη Μινεζότα. Από το 2000 εργάζεται στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο. Τα ερευνητικά του ενδιαφέροντα στρέφονται γύρω κυρίως από τη διατήρηση των Αφρικών μοσχευμάτων. Ε, τον καθηγητή Παπαλόη το γνώρισα το 2012 που είχα πάει στο Χάμερσμιθ και τον βρήκα να διευθύνει το μεγαλύτερο ίσως ε, νεφρι, νεφρολογικό κέντρο της Ευρώπης με πάνω από 20 νεφρολόγους, με πάνω από 1.700 αιμοκαθερόμενους ε, στο κέντρο, με πάνω από 1.700 ίσως ε, μεταμοσχευμένους που παρακολουθούσαν και βέβαια να έχει ένα σκορ πάνω από 200 μεταμοσχεύσεις νεφρού το χρόνο και να πω ότι ήταν μόνο τρεις χειρουργοί στο κέντρο. Ε, κύριε Παπαλόη, θα μας μιλήσετε για τους high-risk ε, δότες νεφρικού μοσχεύματος ζωντανούς. Ε, παρακαλώ. Ε, κύριε Πρόεδρε, αγαπητέ Στέλιο, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για τα, την πολύ ωραία εισαγωγή και παρουσίαση. Αν και από ό,τι έχω δει στο πρόγραμμα, έχω 30 λεπτά για αυτήν και όχι 20. Ελπίζω να, να μου δώσετε αυτά τα 5-10 έξτρα λεπτά, <coughs> εάν χρειαστεί. Ε, Mr. President, dear colleagues, uh, my presentation is about challenging high-risk live donor uh, kidney transplants, and I'm immensely grateful for this uh, invitation to talk about it because I have to say that it is my real uh, passion in life. I don't need to remind you this audience that the first successful live donor kidney transplant, which was the first successful kidney transplant altogether, was done just before Christmas Day of 1954 in this famous hospital in Boston, the Peter Ben Bingham Hospital, and this was the famous surgeon, Joseph Murray, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1990. The two you know, donor and recipient, identical twins, the Herrick brothers, a picture of the famous hospital and the picture of this famous operation. What is important to remember, and I always say this when I give this lecture, is that the night before the operation, Mare was down on his knees with his very big family praying not to go to get the Nobel Prize that he got in 1990, but not to go to jail, because she had to get the permission from three courts to be able to do that. Those days, everybody was against it. Today, everybody's pro-transplant, but the pioneers had to go through hell to be able to do that. It's also an interesting story to say because, you know, it was Christmas, all the nurses were leaving, and there were no nurse to look after the recipient. So there was one poor girl who couldn't go back home to Boston for Christmas because there was a snowstorm, and they told her that you are going to look after him, and that's it. So she looked after him in the recovery room and then on the wards, and then they started dating, and then they got married, and they had a family. And it's, you know, an amazing story to say, and I have to tell you that every single story about live donor kidney transplantation since then is a great story to tell. Since this historic operation in Boston, live donor kidney transplantation became the treatment of choice of end-stage renal failure in North America and Europe, where approximately 50 to 60 percent of transplants were coming from live donor. Every place in Europe, with the exception of Her Majesty's United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, where only 5% of those kidneys were coming from live donors. And who was responsible for this disgrace? We were responsible, the transplant community. Because the mentality was, you have kidney failure, you go on dialysis, we wait to see when, if a cadaveric kidney will come up, and if it doesn't and you start falling apart, we are asking you, do you have a donor? And it should be exactly the other way around. From the moment you run into problems with kidney failure, the next question is who is going to be your donor to be able to have your transplant preemptively before you go on dialysis. Όταν ρωτάω τους φοιτητές μου στις πτυχιακές εξετάσεις ποια είναι η θεραπεία εκλογής της νεφρικής ανεπάρκειας, αν αρχίσουν το γνωστό παραμύθι για φίστουλες, καθετήρες περιτοναϊκής διάθεσης, διάλυση και τα τέτοια, τους πήρε και τους σήκωσε. Η απάντηση είναι μεταμόσχευση νεφρού από ζώντα δότη π 
πριν ο άρρωστο μπει στην αιμοδιάλυση. Αυτή είναι η θεραπεία εκλογή. Και αν είναι ένα μήνυμα να περάσει σήμερα, αυτό το μήνυμα πρέπει να περάσει. With this change of philosophy over the last 15 years in the UK, we went from 5 to 45 percent of our kidney transplants coming from live donors, and at the Hammersmith is close to 60 percent. The first thing you need to establish a high-risk program is to have a proper technique to remove the kidneys, and to have the standard old-fashioned technique with a big incision from the belly button all the way back to the spine, well tested with huge, you know, access for the surgeon. The bad news: big incision. Lots of pain, long stay, and long recovery. In the mid to late 1990s, the minimally invasive keyhole surgery, as the press is calling it, uh, was introduced in uh, the retrieval of those kidneys with smaller incisions, and it was more than one, and a big incision to take the kidney out. Less pain, short hospital stay, and faster return to normal activities. The disadvantages is the conversion of an extraperitoneal operation into an intraperitoneal one. Not immediate access to the vessels of the organ with very lengthy procedures, lengthy warm ischemia time, a nasty effect of the pneumoperitoneum to the cortex of the kidney, a very stiff learning curve, and it's quite expensive. That's why at the Hammersmith we have married the advantages of the classic open technique and the laparoscopic technique in what we call the mini open donor nephrectomy technique. And as you can see, it is an incision of five to six centimeters along the 11th rib of the patient. We get deeper into uh, the wound and expose first the ureter that you can see at the bottom end of this wound. And this is what we have borrowed from the laparoscopic colleagues, the laparoscopic technique, is the ETS flex vascular stapler that you saw in my previous presentation about the pancreas. And the advantage of this instrument is that you can apply it to any structure from far away. The surgeon doesn't have to have his hands into the incision. And that's why you can do everything you know, through a very small incision. And the tip of it can rotate and go to every direction. After the uh, ureter is divided, we are going with the dissection of the vessels, and you can see here a very comfortable dissection of the gonadal vein. And then the renal artery and the renal vein are properly prepared. And again, the instrument is applied from far, far away to the renal artery and the renal vein, giving us a very, very satisfactory length of the vessels. You can see here the kidney bed, which is totally bloodless and very, very neat. The kidney has been removed through the small incision and flushed with preservation solution, not damaged because it came through a very small uh, incision. The incision has exactly the same length, no cheating, you know, subcuticular closure of the skin and a steri strip, and the whole thing is being done in a very efficient way from a small incision with excellent outcomes for the patient. Over the last 15 years of, of so, we have done more than 1,000 cases by using this technique. The skin incision is between, you know, four and a half and eight centimeters with a mean of five and a half. The kidney is out in the mean of 82 minutes. The mean operative time is 110 minutes. The patient body mass index was ranging from 17 and a half to 46. So we take on board some pretty extreme situations. Warm ischemia time of a couple of minutes uh, and the patient length of stay average three days, usually two to four days. And that three to four days, more than anything else, express the generosity of the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. I mean, medically speaking, these patients are able to go home in two days. Regarding the length of the incision, I have to make it crystal clear that I will never jeopardize patient or graft safety for one more centimeter. I never met a patient in my life who told me, Professor Papelois, if the incision is five centimeter, I'll give my wife a kidney. If it's six, let her be on dialysis for 20 years. We have to be reasonable and always put graft and patient safety first. <clears throat> We have done a very interesting meta-analysis published a few years ago, 14 comparative studies, 1,700 patients, 37% of them using the mini-open technique, 32% using the laparoscopic techniques, either in the context of pure laparoscopic or hand-assisted, and 31% the standard old-fashioned technique. So more or less a pretty even split between our technique, laparoscopic techniques, and the standard open. And if you see here the comparison between the mini open and the standard open, there was no debate that the mini open had less operative time, less blood loss, analgesia, and faster, you know, less stay to the hospital and faster return to work. 
And when you compare the mini open to the laparoscopic technique, which is, if you wish, its main competitor, the mini open matched everything that the laparoscopic technique uh, had to offer, and even more, had less operative time and warm ischemia time. And one more factor is approximately 3,000 euros per case cheaper compared to a laparoscopic approach, which I don't need to remind you how important it is in the context of the current financial problems. So you have a very good technique, a very nice, a very safe technique that allows fantastic quality of life for the donors. But you know, if you want to push a higher risk program, the next thing you need to do is to take on the difficult patients. And these are my two mentors, my two, uh, you know, I have them like gods, actually, John and Jerry and David Sutherland, that trained me at the University of Minnesota many years ago. They have almost half a century of experience in doing it, more than 400 transplants a year and 5,000 live donor kidney transplants. And what they always said to me and the other fellows is that, number one, you cannot drop patients just because they are difficult. When you used to say to a Nigerian, you know, this is difficult, he said, yes, young man, that's why I'm training you to do it. Otherwise, I will ask the cleaning lady out there to come in theaters and do it. It's your job to deal with that. And secondly, the patients know what is best for them. So if they are prepared to take certain risks, I am prepared to take it with them as well. And you can see here some elements of our high-risk program, first of all, starting by transplanting kidneys with multiple vessels. This is a kidney that a mother donated to her son with four renal arteries and one renal vein, and all of them, as you can see, pretty small renal arteries. And in this situation, I prefer to do separate arterial anastomosis because this gives better flow to the graft. Uh, if there is a problem with one of them, the rest of them don't pay the price. And if we have a problem with stenosis, for example, in the short or long term, usually in the long term, radiological intervention is much easier through independent anastomosis. Again, as you saw in my pancreatic presentation, I religiously use the aortic punch to make a perfect hole in the iliac vessels of the recipient to facilitate this anastomosis. And you can see here the four renal arteries anastomose separately with a beautiful perfused graft, and the same thing in another kidney with two arteries and two veins. Religiously, post-transplantation immediately, we do ultrasound for these grafts to make sure that everything is uh, you know, going very well. And we learn the lesson the hard way because once you close this patient, if they are a bit obese and if they have some polycystic kidneys, for example, the beautiful graft that you have put in might be squeezed and you have a problem. An early ultrasound postoperatively can indicate that and you can solve the problem. And in this context, you can see the arteries of the previous graft, all four renal arteries buzzing beautifully. Again, you can see here in the context of multiple vessels the advantage of having a separate anastomosis because the lower pole artery of this kidney to your, to, to your left had an early stenosis after the anastomosis, which is very easy for the radiologist to go through the iliac vessels and fix it instead of a you know, reconstructed uh, artery. And what we have implemented now at the Hammersmith is a gadolinium-free special frequency MRA that gives us a very, very a great detail about the anatomy of the renal vessels, especially close to the parenchyma, since our technique starts with you know, procuring the vessels and dissecting the vessels from the graft towards the aorta and the cava. And you can see here, this is the MRI from the same patient, conventional versus new one, the much more detailed anatomy with the new one, especially revealing a second renal artery on the right side, which was not evident before. And when we compare the groups of patients with multiple vessels versus those with single vessels, patient survival was identical between the two groups. The same thing for graft survival and the same thing for their estimated GFRs. Obesity. I mean, the guidelines of the British Transplantation Society said that you should not accept any donor with a BMI over 30. This is approximately 50% of the United Kingdom has a BMI over 30. You can't exclude these patients from being donors. And you can see here two characteristic situations of one donor with a BMI of 41 who gave a kidney to his daughter and another donor with a BMI of 46 who gave a kidney to his mother-in-law in an expression of what we call in the UK unexplained and extreme uh, altruism. But he did it, the poor guy. And when it comes to comparisons between obese and non-obese donors from the technical point of view, time to remove the kidney, warm ischemia time, operative time and length of stay, there was no statistical uh, difference between the obese ones and the non-obese ones with a cutoff, artificial cutoff of a BMI of 30. And again, patient survival, 
of uh, the recipients of uh, kidneys coming from obese donors versus non-obese, exactly the same. Same thing for censored for death allograft survival and the estimated GFRs. Older donors, the most classic question I get when we have patient, you know, seminars for patients and their families to inform them about transplantation is, you know, I'm X years old, can I still do it? And the answer is exactly the answer I gave to Professor Vlahakos just a few minutes ago. We don't care about chronological age, we care about biological age. And we have done donors up to 78 years old, okay, and they're living happily ever after, and approximately 30% of our live donors uh, come from people who are over 60 years old. The Maastricht University, Erasmus, have done donors in their 80s, and one of them they claim 91 year old. And again, the recipients of kidneys coming from elderly donors versus those who are not elderly, cut off again being 60, same patient survival data, same you know, sensor for death allograft survival, and same estimated GFR. And this is an interesting piece of statistics. Uh, one of our registrars put in one hand, you know, recipients who got kidneys from donors with all the risk factors, multiple vessels, obese and older, and on the other hand, those who didn't have any of those risk categories. And again, the comparison show that there was no difference when it comes to patient survival, sensor for death allograft survival, and estimated GFRs. High risk when it comes to aortoiliac disease, pretty common cause of exclusion of patients from listing them for kidney transplantation, the presence of severe aortoiliac disease in the United Kingdom in many centers. And you can see here two nasty examples. On the left-hand side, one patient with a very nasty infiltration uh, of atheroma of all the major vessels. And it's the type of atheroma that makes the surgeon to pee in his pants because it's the atheroma infiltrating the whole wall of the artery and not only segments of it. And on the right-hand side, a lady with a very serious collagen disease uh, that had many dissections of her vessels. And what we did is to do MRAs for all these potential recipients that have certain indications. They were elderly, they had a high BMI, they were diabetic, they had a high cholesterol or they were smoking like chimneys, peripheral vascular disease or previous pelvic surgery. And the scans were you know, scored by two radiologists for atheroma, stenosis, post-stenotic dilatation, thrombus and tortuosity. And you can see here that there was no association between the MRA findings and adverse events post-transplantation, and the other way around, certain advanced events were not associated with the presence or the lack of you know, MRI findings. And uh, the creatinine of these uh, recipients, uh, you know, one year down the road, was not different. Uh, it was independent from the number of MRI findings in the iliac vessels of these recipients. So the bottom line is that the presence of aortoiliac disease is useful to plan an operation. No moron is going to put a kidney where there is a complete stenosis of the left common iliac artery there, the, but it should not be an exclusion criterion for transplantation because the outcome is really good. High risk venous problems. We, can, we have many patients in our program with very well known procoagulants, lupus anticoagulant, for example, that they have thrown many thrown by right, left, and center in, in their life. And you can see one of them with a filter in his cava, another patient with venous hypertension and uh, uh, collaterals. And also patients who have venous problems because of multiple previous groin lines for dialysis or the use of those in a very small cohort of patients for big cannulae for heart transplantation. And in this scenario, you need to have a patient who, was who is very well filled and start heparin infusion intraoperatively if you want to avoid tr uh, trouble. This organ will not thrombose on you two days post-transplantation. It will thrombose on you. It will start thrombosing on you immediately post-implantation. You have to be brave enough to press the heparin button during surgery. When you have more than one ureter, I religiously do two separate anastomoses. And although it is a big pain in the rear end, we do in, you know, anastomosis with you know, independent sutures. And this makes all the difference, they make a break, in order to avoid having strictures in the long term. Because the ureteric anastomosis, a leak, everybody can avoid a leak. The, key, the Achilles heel of the ureteric anastomosis is the long term stricture, which sometimes can be very nasty and extremely difficult to treat. This is another interesting patient with a ureteric problem. This is a lady who had, you know, removal of her kidneys and her bladder at an early age because of cancer. She had a previous kidney transplant that was, you know, drained through an allial conduit. She lost this to uh, uh, rejection, and we did a second kidney transplant to her and anastomosed her ureter to the allial conduit. 
Being a very old allyl conduit, this leaked initially, and we re-explored here. And as you can see, we redid this anastomosis of the ureter to the allyl conduit. And then we used all the inflammatory tissue around it to create a shield and make sure that she would not have any further leaks. And she's living very well since then with, uh, you know, without a stent. We have transplanted kidneys with tumors, with cancer. In some of them we knew beforehand that there was a cancer, in some of them we didn't. And we found out incidentally during the operation. And we're talking about tumors up to one and a half, two centimeters, which are simple renal cell carcinomas, not clear cell carcinomas. And in this situation, we are excising them all the way to healthy margins, close in two or three layers the kidney parenchyma and transplant them. And we have a pretty good follow-up. You can see here, you know, excision all the way to healthy margins, and you have to work very closely with your radiologist, with your pathologist for that to make sure you are on clear margins closure and transplantation. And I will strongly advise you to read the paper from my good colleague, uh, Professor Nichols from the Royal Free, now the Marsden, that he reviewed a very big cohort of patients around the world with excision of cancer from the kidneys and transplantation. Polycystic kidneys, I used to be very conservative, and I used to put the kidneys in in these patients, even if they have homongous polycystic kidneys, if I had the space to do it. But I discovered that my patients post-transplantation were extremely unhappy because they were off dialysis, but they were looking like nine-month pregnant ladies with triplets, actually. And this was jeopardizing the quality of their lives. So we remove these kidneys now to the majority of these patients with pretty good outcomes, and we transplant them, you know, a few months down the road. Sometimes they pay the price of going on dialysis a little bit earlier than expected, but it's a price they are prepared to pay. <clears throat> and you can see here <clears throat> the magnificent results uh, uh, but of the implementation of the measures I mentioned to you. First of all, a change in mentality and making preemptive live donor kidney transplantation the treatment of choice of end-stage renal failure. Secondly, having a technique to remove the kidney which is safe and ends up in fantastic results for the recipient. And thirdly, you know, push the envelope and do the operations for the high-risk patients. Look at this disgrace in the mid-1990s in the United Kingdom. Big centers like us, guys, George's, Free and the London, doing you know, five, six, seven live donor transplants a year. And look at the explosion you know, in the 2005, 2006, and 2007 with us very proudly, I have to say, leading the way. And you can see here the most recent and updated data from the United Kingdom where we, we perform comfortably uh, 1,100 live donor kidney transplants a year, and it has become the treatment of stories of end-stage uh, renal failure. Follow-up, you can see here 14 years follow-up, and this is very, very strong data from our program. This is Hammersmith. Patient survival when it comes to uh, recipients that got kidneys from live donors, 96.8% versus 82.9% for those who got kidneys from deceased donors. And when it comes to graft survival censored for death uh, with function, uh, almost 83% graft survival 14 years down the road compared to 67% when it comes from uh, deceased donors. And this is the last message I always give to my medical students and my juniors, because they always get fascinated about Joseph, Murray, and John and Jerry, and, and all the giants and the pioneers. And what I'm telling them is, guys, there are no brave surgeons, there are no brave nephrologists, and there are no brave immunologists. They are only very brave patients. These are the ones who are always the driving force behind the live donor kidney transplant, and mainly the donor. These are the only ones who can give this wonderful gift of life painted here in the most beautiful painting in the world by the greatest artist of all time in Michelangelo. This is in the Sistine uh, Chapel in, Lom, in Rome. What we can do from our point of view is to work closely as a team and support them for life. Transplantation is not a sprint, is a marathon. And what we need to ensure our patients, and this is the hallmark not of a great team, but of the greatest team of all, is that they will never walk alone. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την καταπληκτική ομιλία. Παρόλο ότι είναι διάλεξη, θα, θα επιτρέψουμε μία-δύο ερωτήσεις. Ο κύριος Αποστόλου. Συγχαρητήρια για την πολύ ωραία ομιλία σας και για όλα όσα μας λέτε, για την πορεία σας. Και θα θέλαμε να άρχισε τη συχνότητα να σας ακούμε και να βλέπουμε πώς μπορεί κανείς να πάει μπροστά με δουλειά και να αυξήσει το 
τη μεταμοσχεύση. Ήθελα να ρωτήσω γιατί, για του για τους δότε μεγάλη ηλικία. Υπάρχει ένα cut-off τη πειραματική διήθηση που δεν θα πάτε, γιατί υπάρχουν και 80 χρονών άνθρωποι βιολογικά που Ένα cut-off τη πειραματική διήθηση. Εξαρτάται όχι μόνο ναι. από τη πειραματική διήθηση, αλλά από την όλη εικόνα και το προσδόκιμο επιβίωση. Ναι, όταν όλα τα άλλα είναι καλά. Όχι, όχι δεν υπάρχει κατόφ. Να σας δώσω ένα παράδειγμα, το οποίο ήταν στην Αμερική όταν ήμουν α, α, ειδικευόμενο, όταν ήμουν φέλλο. Είχαμε το δικαίωμα να πούμε ναι ή όχι σχετικά με τις μεταμοσχεύσεις. Για να σας δείξω πόσο σχετικό είναι, αυτό είναι το, το point το οποίο θέλω να κάνω. Και ήταν ένα ζευγάρι και οι δυο γύρω στα 75-76, ε, άντρα σε γυναίκα και εκείνος ήθελε να δώσει ένα νεφρό σε εκείνη. Ο, η πειραματική διήθηση ήταν borderline και οι νεφρολόγοι μου λέγανε: Ξέχασέ το, αν το κάνουμε αυτό, αυτό ο άνθρωπο 6-7-8 χρόνια θα είναι στην αιμοδιάλυση, ίσω και νωρίτερα. Και έλεγα: Όχι, 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 όχι. Ζήτησαν να με δουν. Και μου λένε: Γιατί για μου μα σταματά, και λέω: Τα δεδομένα. Και μου λένε: Άκουσα να σου πω: Πόσα καλά χρόνια μα έχουν μείνει, 7-8 χρόνια. Θέλουμε αυτά τα χρόνια να είμαστε ελεύθεροι από την αιμοδιάλυση, θέλουμε να ταξιδέψουμε, να δούμε τα εγγόνια μα. Τώρα, όταν θα είμαστε 85 χρονών, αν ένα από εμά κυγιώνει στην αιμοδιάλυση, δεν μα ενδιαφέρει. Θέλω να πω ότι δίνουμε μεγάλη σημασία στο πόσο ρίσκο είναι ετοιμασμένοι να πάρουν οι ασθενεί και στου λόγου για του οποίου θέλουν να κάνουν τη μεταμόσχευση. Και όχι απλώ στου αριθμού. Επίση, να αναφέρω, μια και το είπατε, ότι το κλειδί τη επιτυχία μα είναι η εξαιρετικά στενή συνεργασία μα με του νεφρολόγους. Δουλεύουμε σαν μία ομάδα και κοιτάμε αυτού του αρρώστου πάντα μαζί στο προεγχειρητικό, διεγχειρητικό και μετεγχειρητικό στάδιο. Ο κ. Παναγούτσο το έζησε ε, από κοντά. Οι Γερμανοί συνάδελφοι πηγαίνουν ένα βήμα πιο εκεί, στο Essen που είχα επισκεφθεί πρόσφατα ω επισκέπτη καθηγητή, ο καλό μου φίλο ο Ανδρέα Πολ. Έχουν νεφρολόγο στο χειρουργείο με σκραμπς πλημμένο για τα high-risk transplants. Για να μπορέσει να κάνει μόνη του αυτού του αρρώστου, όταν έχει να κάνει μια κατακλυσμική αιμορραγία, δεν έχει το μυαλό να ασχοληθεί με όλα τα υπόλοιπα θέματα αυτού του αρρώστου. Και ο νεφρολόγο είναι πλημμένο στο χειρουργείο και δουλεύει με τον αναισθησιολόγο για αυτά τα high risk transplants. Είναι το κλειδί τη επιτυχία. Έχουμε τώρα τέσσερι Έλληνε νεφρολόγου στο department ε, που κάνουν επόσυζη τη φέλο με εμά και είναι θαυμάσιοι και οι τέσσερι και μεγαλώνουν ακριβώ με αυτή την οτροπία. Άλλη ερώτηση, άλλο σχόλιο. Ωραία. Βασίλη, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Παρακαλώ.